Welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Those of you who are joining us, uh, regular viewers, then you might uh, remember, of course, that we are UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. The thing that distinguishes us is that we uh, represent individuals and groups who support this concept of one man, one woman, monogamous marriage for life. It's a, a key principle that we think is really important for society. It's not to recognise that other things don't exist in a, a liberal democracy. They do quite clearly. But we think that that form of marriage is very distinct. It carries uh, particular benefits to society. And we want to emphasise those benefits and to promote its worth in our land and in our time. And doing something slightly different today, we're going to look at a book that's currently been released. That's been a lot of talk about. It's an excellent book. Um, the uh, War on the West by Douglas Murray. And there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to look at this book. Not so much for what it says, though what it says is very important, but for a couple of things that it doesn't say and uh, pertaining to marriage and the family itself. It's a real privilege to have a guest talking to us about that book today, um, Tim Dieppe. Tim, say hi. Hi, thank you very much for having me, Tony. Great to have you here, Tim. Now, Tim, of course, you work for uh, Christian Concern. You're the head of uh, public policy. You're also uh, an author in your own right. Um, and, uh, you know, people may well have seen you on places like GB News talking about things that uh, will matter to all of our viewers um, here. Tim, uh, you've you've read the book, I'm guessing. I have. Yes. Enjoyed it. Yeah. And you've written a review on it, I think. So we'll we'll cover a few of those grounds. But first of all, uh, Douglas Murray, um, if you haven't heard from him, he's or of him, he's a, a contemporary author, uh, an increasingly well-known author and commentator and newspaper columnist, lots of other things. Uh, he's written books including The Strange Death of Europe, which is an absolutely profound book that I would recommend people, anybody interested in the immigration debate and all the complexities of that debate, Go and read that book. It's a it's a great book to read. And he also wrote recently The Madness of Crowds, which uh, is another uh, very uh, profound book looking at uh, some of the things that are going on in society today. Uh, Tim, I wonder if we can start just his latest book, uh, The War on the West. How would you say it differs from um, The Madness of Crowds, first of all? Yeah, so start with telling you, I have I have not written a review of War on the West yet, but I have written reviews of both the Strange Death of Europe and the Madness of Crowds. You can just, if you just Google Tim Dieppe, The Strange Death of Europe, or Tim Dieppe, Madness of Crowds, you'll find it very easily. Um, and um, the Madness of Crowds is kind of about, um, you know, he's starting to see there some of the, you know, influence of critical race theory and of what we call wokeism or cultural Marxism, he refers to it in that book. And he's talking about issues of race and sex and gender and LGB to a degree. Um, stuff in that book and he's saying you know gosh look how mad and that's the right word isn't it mad um, society or at least some of our society has become in terms of the crazy ideas that they're proposing transgenderism clearly being one of them and um, and sort of calling it out and saying you know there's a problem here and um, and lamenting the loss of a moral framework even specifically lamenting, lamenting the loss of a Christian moral framework without being a Christian himself. Um, and then, so you then get to War on the West, and the War on the West it sort of takes it a step further, and he sort of says is that actually this whole thing, it's it's not just sort of um, victimhood status, which is giving people a voice. It, it's not just sort of crazy ideas, but it's actually deliberately attempting to dismantle Western ideology and even Western civilization uh, to a degree. And so this is why he calls it War on the West. And he, he, he moves away from sort of the cultural Marxism label into the wokeism uh, kind of label uh, for this kind of stuff. And he has chapters on race and um, religion and culture. And he sort of exposes it on history as well. And he sort of exposes how this whole, what he would call a woke or anti-Western ideology has gained incredible influence in our culture, in mainstream culture, over mainstream institutions like the National Trust or the British Museum, in education and universities and so on. And it's quite an alarming read and quite a quite a depressing read, Tony, I found, because there's no, it doesn't offer any solutions. It just says, look what a problem we've got here. And he's very good at saying this is the problem um, without really having any answers to it. You, you're absolutely right, Tim. I, f I think... 
when I read it, um, I noticed a gap. And um, I might describe the book as a ring donut. You know, it's, 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 it's very tasty to read. It's got a lot of stuff, but there seemed to me to be a bit missing in the middle. And the bit that he doesn't seem to touch on at all when he looks at the way um, Western society is being attacked and declining is the concept of the family. The mum and dad bringing up a child, passing on the culture, passing on, uh, you know, traditions throughout time in the kind of family model. And that seems to be a massive gap. That's kind of gap number one, because, you know, we are facing a declension in those things in society more generally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the research indicates that's going to lead to bad outcomes because um, yeah. when, parent, when children don't grow up with their, you know, their biological mum and dad, that has big influences on society. Yeah. Um, and also he, he talks about, which will bring my, my next gap, if you like, and perhaps you can uh, tell us what he says. He brings out almost like a model that everyone seems to be using when they attack the West. It's almost like a, uh, a methodology, whether it be attacking the West over race or, or attacking the West over, um, you know, old cultural uh, quotes, abuses, unquotes. Um, can you recall what sort of model he says everyone seems to be using? Uh, well, do you mean the sort of wokeism victimhood model? Is that what you're talking about, Tony? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, uh, the sort of model I, I noted, which um, seems to be a, a, a pathological approach that he uh, puts his finger on, if you like, is this thing of saying, well, look, we've been hurt. Um, we've, you know, our feelings have been hurt. And irrespective of what you say about the, the facts of um, the instances of those things taking place, actually, uh, the fact that you're using logic, for example, the fact that you're even arguing is proof of the fact that you are part of the problem. And those things are impossible to argue with. He brings up the, the really interesting example of um, witches back in, in uh, you know, <laughs> terrible times yeah. when uh, um, if a woman uh, drowned, uh, it meant she was innocent when she was being tried for being a witch. If, uh, if she survived, it meant she was a witch and then had to die via other means. So there was no win. There was no solution. And in many ways, that's exactly the approach which is being taken. You know, uh, you're being accused of, let's pick an example, uh, uh, racism. Uh, if you argue against that accusation, it proves you're racist. If you don't, well, it must mean that we were correct. No, I agree. And he, he takes aim at critical race theory on this and sort of exposes that it's, it's actually, you know, strangely named, isn't it? Because it's actually getting away from any criticism at all. It's kind of like, you know, it, it gets away from any objectivity. It makes it entirely subjective um, and then says, you know, well, if you're, if you're white, you're racist. And if you try and deny that, that's just proof you're racist uh, kind of thing. And so, like you say, you're kind of, you know, that is actually, of course, a racist statement itself to say, if you're white, you're racist. That, that is, yeah, it's actually racist itself by the normal definition. So, yes, how do we get out of that? You know, how do we escape from that? You know, it's very because then they say, well, you know, logical argument and reason, that's Western imperialism. That's also, you know, white stuff. And therefore, you know, you impose your logical view. That's this extraordinary stuff, which I hadn't even appreciated about. People even try and argue that maths is racist and to the extent that people even try and argue two plus two could be five, why not? Um, when, they, when they pointed out that um, that's actually what Orwell said, they got a bit, little bit uh, surprised and upset about that. But um, it's this view that even when he points to simple, straightforward, logical statements like two plus two is four, people say, oh, that's just a product of Western imperialism or the he hegemony or something like that. Um, and then you get to something slightly slightly more difficult, let's say, you know, can men and women change sex? Um, well, again, you know, the answer is obviously no, but the culture somehow accepts, well, well, yes, they can. And how can you possibly say no? And so we get to this incredible sort of departure from common sense and reason. And in some ways, Tony, that gives me a bit of hope because I think, how far can culture go that departs from common sense and reason until there comes a point where everyone decides to rebel against this departure from reason and common sense by saying, let's get back to common sense, let's get back to reason, let's even get back to tradition, let's even get back to Christianity and Christian values. I mean, because the rebellious thing to do is to end up being traditional kind of thing. 
I mean, you, you're, you're absolutely right, Tim. And one thing um, Murray does do, it, as, as new atheists, that's a slightly different group, but people who aren't believers in the Christian faith, but nevertheless look on the Judeo-Christian tradition as something which is worthwhile to base a society on. And, and Murray, I think, would fall into that category. At least has but, been worthwhile, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But another, another gap, I would say, is that, so he touches on the trans thing and the trans phenomenon in his, in his book, which kind of, in many senses, many people would say defies logic and what's before your eyes. Yet what he doesn't do is talk about where that came from. So example, the gay activism movement from back in the 60s, um, you know, after the Stonewall riots, the Gay Liberation Front, their manifesto, for example, said, we want to abolish gender roles. The way to, to promote LGBT rights is to abolish gender roles. We want to um, ab abandon the notion of, of uh, the family, to dismantle the concept of family, get rid of it altogether. Yeah. Um, so you kind of think, and he doesn't touch on those things. And from my perspective, you know, one of the biggest problems we have, one of the biggest intergenerational problems we have um, is this lack of connection between family, this uh, move away from the standard family unit, which uh, the research would indicate really is the best environment to bring kids up in. And I, yeah, I know that that's not always possible and that other things happen. But actually, in terms of what's best for society, uh, somebody growing up with their biological mum and dad who are committed to each other for life, that's by far and away the best approach to be taken. And society is just moving away from that. And that really is at the, the foundation of so much of the malaise that's going on, which leads to everything else. Things like these gender uh, fluid roles and, and all sorts of other confusion about uh, who you are as opposed to what your role is in society. Uh, he doesn't touch on any of that at all. No, that's right. And, and generally I think this is a, a thing with the book. It's kind of like a description of where we're at um, without any explanation quite of how we got there, really. Um, and neither a solution how we get out of it either. So there's, there's no sort of analysis of how do we get here. I think you and I have read Carl Truman's book, which actually is very good on that um, in terms of um, explaining you know, how we get to this kind of transgenderism type of thing. Murray doesn't touch on any of that. He's basically saying, this is where we are now. This is how the culture is affected by all this stuff. And this is a problem without offering a solution. So it's, so it's pure sort of current diagnosis without saying either what went wrong or how we get it right again. And in that sense, it's a depressing read because you know there's no answers given, there's no solutions given, and there's no explanation for how we got to this mess. Um, that's what struck me most. And of course, you're right, family is one of the biggest issues you know that's the root of a lot of these problems as, you know as, and has huge economic costs as well as ethical moral and social cost um to society and um maybe that's something that murray doesn't want to go down there i don't know maybe he doesn't want to touch that subject he, he's very brave on lots of other subjects but he, he he won't quite go for this or maybe it's a blind spot that he has i don't know I don't know. I, I mean, f f you mentioned um, uh, Carl Truman's um, uh, latest book, Strange New World, if anybody wants to look it up. Again, it's, it's a relatively short book, much like uh, the one we're talking about. And I would thoroughly recommend people read it if, uh, either instead of or alongside Murray's book. It's a, a very succinct and very um, astute commentary on what's happening in society. And additionally, as you mentioned, uh, Tim, perhaps some ways in which we uh, get ourselves out of this particular mess or at least stop getting deeper uh, into it. Um, thinking about another part of, of Murray's book, he goes on to look at uh, the, the state of the church, um, which I, I thought, again, was a little bit hollow, um, typically of somebody who maybe admittedly and understandably doesn't know much about the church because isn't that involved with it. But again, when he looks at the church, he, he criticises quite rightly and you know, mentions the fact that maybe these days you're more likely to hear a sermon on climate change uh, or on racism uh, rather than uh, a sermon on, on uh, Jesus Christ and, and his atoning work, let's say. Um, but that's interesting for two points, if you like, and, and that here's another gap coming up. Um, firstly, well, there's nothing wrong with, with you know, talking about Christians uh, need to look after the earth and certainly not to be racist. What he really misses when he talks about um, frictions in the church, 
first of all, same sex marriage yeah. and the fact how that has and is splitting different denominational churches in two. Yeah. And secondly, of course, this much greater threat which is the proposed ban on so-called conversion therapy, which is nothing more, it seems to me, than an attempt to redefine not only marriage, but redefine sin. You cannot say that homosexuality is a sin. That seems to me to be what it's looking for there. Those two really, really big issues, which are really challenging the church and splitting it in two on many, in, in many instances, just aren't mentioned at all. No, although I would say that conversion therapy does get covered in matters of crowds. And he does actually say in that book, actually in the very first chapter, I think, that um, he doesn't support banning new laws to ban conversion therapy um, in that book. And he does talk about that in, in, you know, in, in you know, a few pages, at least. There's a reasonable coverage of it in that, in that book. And it starts from the beginning. Um, so, but not in the context of church, like you say, when he does do that. Um, and again, it's not in this book either. Um, what he's saying in this book is that wokeism or anti-racism um, is the new religion and um, and it's kind of taken over and, and our, our mainstream donations are kind of like falling over themselves to adapt to culture as they see it by, you know, by woke virtue signaling um, and saying, you know, we're, we're doing all the right things here, we're doing all the right things there. And of course, part of that is same-sex marriage. You know, and, and wanting to come, wanting to say, oh yes, we agree with the culture on this, um, and part of it is as well um, the conversion therapy thing. The Church of England Synod actually um, a few years ago and actually voted to ban conversion therapy, and asked the government to do that. Um, so, and this whole you know rebellion against family values and against the family has sadly infiltrated the church, and that's really the most serious problem, and that's the most mm. obvious sign that the church those kind of churches at least have gone wrong. And as, as, as Murray sort of quotes, you know, former Anglican Bishop Namaka Nazarelli, we, why throw out the message of Christ for a message based on Marxist ideas of exploitation um, is one quote or another one where he says, the old gospel can barely be discerned in all this, but the new gospel most certainly can be. And someday it may be all there is left. You know? um, and so, you know, and you look at the churches and the, the ways that they're, they're falling over to virtue signal and adopt um, anti-family things, things that actually are not just and, and not right and not supporting families. And you think, yes, you know, Murray's right. And if, uh, for Murray as a non-Christian to sort of lament that the church can't even stand up for traditional values is quite interesting, isn't it? it it's very interesting, Tim. And again, you know, I think who knows what the, the underlying cause of that is in the church. You know, hey, we recognise we have... Um, uh, supporters of the Coalition for Marriage from all faiths and none. And, you know, we come at this argument, much as Murray does, uh, very much from a secular evidence base. And it kind of brings me to the last gap um, that I've, I've spotted in, in, in what is, you know, admittedly uh, an otherwise excellent work and something worthy of reading and a very entertaining read. And this concept is that one of the problems we seem to have in society, in, in, in as much as I can see it, is this tendency to separate um, private life from public life. If, for example, you have an affair and break the COVID rules by, you know, entering within two metres of somebody else within an office environment, you should lose your job, not for um, breaching the, the, the most deepest fundamental trust with the people closest to you, but for breaking a distance rule. And you kind of think that, that to me, is indicative of another big problem we've got in society that it's almost as if people can do what they want they can have random sex with strangers in toilets on clapham common but that should never affect their role in public office as if the person you are in private has no bearings on the person you are in public and i think that's something we've lost in our culture it never used to be the case and uh, expecting that people can separate their lives like that I think is part of the problem we've got in society. Well, the great sort of riposte to that, Tony, is to say, would you think that someone who's racist in private could, yeah, wouldn't be racist in public? You know, you know, it, you know if, if they're racist in private, are they, you know, is that enough yeah, 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 racist? Yeah. Well, it is, you know. So, and, and people would accept that because racism is the big thing that everyone's, you know, rightly concerned about, but you know, in a way that's gone wrong in some ways. Yeah. And 
And then, you know, but then on other things like general morality or sexual morality, people seem to suddenly manage to siphon that off and say, oh, it doesn't matter how immoral they are in private, as long as in public they're okay. And this logic doesn't work. How come for racism it does matter and for sexual morality it, it doesn't? You know, um, how come, you know, surely how you treat those closest to you, those who, who, who trust you the most and those who know you the best, is the best indicator of how, how trustworthy you are. And if you're willing to betray the people closest to you, then surely you'll be even more willing to betray people who are further away from you, which would include the general public. Um, yep. And so, you know, not to comment on any particular politician, but, you know, clearly, you know, um, adultery, <laughs> family yeah. loyalty and all that kind of stuff is an indication of somebody who, who um, isn't moral and can't be trusted. Sadly, Tim, there's more than one of them and they're on both sides of the aisle. So, you know, it's not a, a party thing. It's uh, just the state of where we are. And, and I think personally, I think we need to go back to a, uh, a place where actually you look at the whole person. Uh, and, uh, you know, because that's that's what we are, really. We're integrated personalities. We're not divided up in between public people and private people. We are what we are. Um, Tim, it's lovely to talk to you. I think we need to do more of this and to kind of highlight some books. Um, I would recommend people read Murray's book. It's, um, it's very prescient for today. Uh, it's very well written and it has some interesting and amusing, anec amusing anecdotes. Uh, but please, when you're reading it, just bear in mind those gaps and pop across, as you well mentioned, um, Tim, to uh, Carl Truman's book, Strange New World as well, released uh, very recently too. Uh, the two together, I think, uh, give you a good picture of where we are and what's going on. Great. Thank you, Tony. Well, pleasure to talk to you, Tim. Have a great day. Thank you.